Well, Chef Kevin Mitchell, um, good to see you, man. Good to see you. Listen, um, we've got a lot um, that's going on in our city. And um, I was just thinking, I said, this is a good time to kind of talk to folks and see, you know, where we're at and where we're going. And um, with a lot of unrest, kind of what advice we could give to folks that are, um, that are passionate about uh, seeing change, but the ways that they can do it to make it an effective way of, of um, having change. So before we get into all of that, let's talk a little bit about you. You've got a rich history in the uh, culinary um, industry. And I know in 2008, you um, graduated, uh, uh, became the first African-American chef instructor at the Culinary Institute at Trident Technical College. So I know that was an opportunity for you to uh, meet a lot of students, and particularly students that look like you and I, and kind of put them on the, the right track. You moved on from that, and you've done some things. You've got a master's degree as well also, but it all kind of seems to come full circle for you as far as taking what you have and and um, giving that or, or are teaching others on there. So talk a little bit about um, your history, the history of, of passing on, you know, what you have, and then we'll kind of delve into again, where do we go from here? Okay, well, <clears throat> like you said, yes, in 2008, um, coming to to Charleston to to teach at the Culinary Institute of Charleston was a, it was a huge thing for me. Um, the, of course, the, the Dean, Mike Sabo, actually came to find me. I was living in Michigan at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I guess his directive was to find an African American chef who had a specific background that could come and teach. Um, and, and coming here and visiting, of course, visiting uh, Charleston was was it was just a beautiful experience. You know, I read a lot about Charleston. Of course, read a lot about the food scene here in Charleston, which and at that at that time things were really starting to kind of ramp up here as far as you know the great chefs that we have in the city. Um, but coming here was very important for me because um, the fact that they didn't have an African-American chef instructor um, at the school. And that was kind of some of the journeys that I faced in my own culinary education, going to a culinary school in New York that had maybe one or two. And now they actually have three campuses, um, actually four, um, um, three here in America and, and, and one in, in Hong Kong, where between the four, there's still maybe one or two African-American chef instructors. So um, it was very important for me to, to come here um, and, and help mold these future minds, these future chefs, um, black and white, but definitely importantly to, to give those African-American students some hope and for them to see someone that looks like them that has achieves specific things and that, that is still doing the work. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the other things too, uh, years later you moved on and you became the chef coordinator for Nat Fuller's Feast. Now that was interesting. I read, you know, some up on that on the Nat Fuller's Feast and the original feast, you know, how like the Fuller's famous uh, bachelor's retreat restaurant was the first to bring together uh, both black and white patrons to break bread in a celebration of uh, the end of the Civil War. Very interesting about that. Tell me about that experience. Well, that um, experience, that was probably the, the catalyst that set me on the path to really want to find out, research, and expose people to, to the stories of uh, formerly enslaved cooks, um, specific, spe specifically here in Charleston. And learning about Nat Fuller's history and the story and the fact that he was a former slave and he went on to own his own restaurant based on the help with his former owner. Um, and then of course holding this, this, this dinner that once again brought blacks and whites together to, to celebrate in an environment of equality and also to look ahead to um, some type of reconciliation and you know give, give people hope that you know those, those things would be possible. And holding that dinner for me, some 150 years later, uh, once again, was a really great thing, and it, it set me on the path to to get my master's degree, to to do the research, to write the thesis that talks about not only him but some of the other enslaved cooks who who make Charleston history, and also just kind of really focusing on the ones that have no names, like mm -hmm. really researching and finding, you know, 
where these enslaved cooks were purchased, right? We, we realized that they were mainly purchased through private sale, right? Which kind of debunks some of the theories that we know about slavery where every, everyone was sold publicly. Well, these, because they had a specific skill, made them very important. It gave them agency um, in, the, <clears throat> in the city. And once again, to tell their stories how through their condition, they still were able to persevere and become some of the greatest black caterers and chefs in, in our city. So that, that was a, a great piece on, on that dinner, and it kind of brings us fast forward to what we see today that's going on, not only in our beloved city, but across the nation, where we see, you know, folks are kind of in an, uh, uh, there's an uneasiness about mm -hmm. what's going on, and um, you talked about the reconciliation and trying to get folks to understand each other. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, how does your work, or uh, how do you work towards um, a goal of like racial equality or telling the true African American story? Well, once again, the, the work, the research, um, exposing people to to these stories, mm -hmm. really getting people to understand like where where these people come from, um, and how it is important for us to not only embrace our history, but to get them to understand their importance in in in, in our city, spe specifically as it relates to food. You know, they lay the foundation for how we eat today, whether it's here in our city or cities across the country. They lay the foundation, and it's important for people to, to kind of understand. I think if you understand someone's story, I think it makes it easier for you to, to um, understand where they're coming from, and it makes it easier for us to, for people to, to kind of get along. And I think, you know, doing that work is very important. And, and I always encourage people to, to read and research and really, mm -hmm. and of course, as as an educator to educate yourself and really find those true stories and you know and ex, you know and especially for 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 the young culinarians who are african american for them to understand and realize embrace their history um, <clears throat> and also honor their history you always have to honor those people where you where you come from because without them there is no me there's mm -hmm. no there's no other chefs that you could even think of without without you know really focusing on them and their stories. Sure. Now we've seen, and I'm sure you you've seen uh, the video and probably some in person too, where you know we had the um, protests that have been going on for you know for for a week or so on there, and there are a lot of, of young folks that are out and they're hitting the streets to protest, and um, you know there's nothing like a wonderful, peaceful protest. So I guess my question to you also, and, and thinking in terms of the same group and, and uh, what kind of message, or what do you tell a young person that um, they want to get out and they want to protest, peacefully protest for racial equality? What kind of message would you send to them? Is there a, a um, is there a certain way that they need to do? Are there particular things that they need to do? I think one of the most important things is they have to understand what protest is mm -hmm. like, and actually how to protest, mm -hmm. right? Like you said, there's, there are great ways to peacefully protest um, for a cause. But then, of course, they go very wrong when negativity starts to come in and when people start the looting mm -hmm. and the rioting. That, mm -hmm. that is something that mm -hmm. they should never embrace no matter what they really have to understand what a peaceful protest is and also they do the research like mm -hmm. research other protests that mm -hmm. happen throughout our history and and get them to understand how to do that um, as an educator I always encourage young people to to educate themselves to to read to research to you know find the information on your own it's it's one thing to kind of go to someone and ask them. And it's great to go to your elders mm -hmm. who've lived and they've seen things and get that oral history, but you also need to go and research on your own. Mm -hmm. like, you know, we're at an age where technology is <laughs> leaps and bounds yeah, from when I was growing up. So, you know, read books, like, you know, ask people what, what books should they be reading, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
also, of course, you know, donating, of course, is, is, is also a very good thing to do. But research those, those organizations that you are donating to because mm -hmm. you don't always necessarily know some of the underlying things that these organizations do and who they really are, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure your money is going for the right cause. So in other words, educate <clears throat> yourself on what it is that you're doing. Yeah. So what, I get, and if a, a young person that just wants to say, I want to do something, something other than say, um, I'm, I'm uh, protesting, I'm out the streets, or I'm out at uh, Marion Square, what are some of the other things that you, you think they can do to make that impact, kind of that right now impact to get that message or their message across on racial yeah. equality? Well, for me, um, it start for for me. It's starting from, from of course reading, and then main thing is writing. Like write, write a piece that talks about, you know, your feelings as it relates to racial inequality and how you feel about it and how you, how you feel other people see it, right? And just for me, and I just recently did that. I just kind of did a dump on, you know, wanting to write a letter to to black chefs to kind of get them to realize that now now is the time right now is the time with all the unrest and everything that's going on in cities across the country now is the time to to speak and we know that people don't we all protest and do things on different levels mm -hmm. some of us are out in the streets and they're doing the silent protests or the peaceful protests and some of us are at home but because we're at home doesn't mean that we're not thinking about it mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we're not protesting and that's how you can do that you can write mm -hmm. right and then you can just post on social media we know the power of social media but you know also but just be very cognizant of of the things that you write sure and understand you know you're you're there to write a, a piece or to post something to get people to think and not get them to react to something negatively or say well this person made this post and you know and and for the people that read to in necessarily don't internalize what the post is because the post may not have anything to do with you. It's mm -hmm. just someone stating their opinion, someone stating their feelings, and the person that needs that message will get it, right? And the person who t internalizes it maybe should kind of look inside themselves really and, mm -hmm. and understand why they upset about this post. Specifically, if it has really nothing to do with them, and then I always, you know, my my one of my mantras is when you post something, when you say something, and when people react, and if they react in a in a negative way, you know, I always say, you know, the truth hurts. Yeah. So when you react, you are getting some truth, and and it's great that it's making you think, and mm -hmm. but you know, just react in in a, in a way that is gonna, for one, make you proud, make your family proud, you know. Looting and rioting, that is not, that's not the way to go. Exactly. So what do you think it is that um, our generation, uh, we should be doing to understand or, or feel the, the pain and concerns of the younger, the 21s, 20, in fact, some were um, out, I think, protesting as young as 16, 17. But how do you think, uh, what, what responsibility do we have to hear them and try to understand them. Well, well, you said it. We have to hear them, then we have to listen to them. Like, well, there's a difference between hearing mm -hmm. and listening, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to really listen to them, and then try to understand where they're coming from. Because we all are, we're from different generations, so we were all raised differently. Mm -hmm. Different things happened in our lives through our generation, and we just need to we we need to listen. We need to encourage them. We need to also offer our hand and, and, and help them um, and, and guide them down down the down that right path. Right? When they wanna go out and, and loot and riot, we gotta stand and step in there and say, look, this is not how anything gets done. Those nothing really happens from that. Mm -hmm. People go out and they of course they you acquire goods, you steal goods and that's that's material. But when that that rush of oh I just got this brand new TV and I broke into this store. Once that kind of, that feeling goes away, what have you accomplished? Mm -hmm. You haven't accomplished anything. You mm -hmm. just, yeah, you got a brand new TV, but you probably could go to jail for it because you stole it. Right. right. But I mean, I think we have to, we definitely have to listen and, yeah. and, and guide, guide them. And 
we we have to also be very honest with them. We can't mm-hmm. we can't sugarcoat things. I mean, life is real, and we have to be as real as life is, mm-hmm. so they understand. And you know, the encouraging of them to to voice their opinions and to uh, you know peacefully protest, and of course to to get their educations and and to do all those things as well. Mm-hmm. And government local leaders um uh, state leaders and all um these this same generation younger generation they're looking to them and they're saying they're not doing what should be done so now the the onus is on the younger generation to say oh, it is t- it's time for me to look at stepping up into politics so perhaps i can get what i want done done by being in a particular position yeah i mean d- the, that's the most important thing is you know we we have to vote mm-hmm. I mean, young and old mm-hmm. um, but those of us the older generation especially those who are in politics they need to listen as well mm-hmm. they need to encourage um, youth to step in you know the world of politics um, and we we just have to you know also encourage them to once you like you said to get into Politics. It's one thing to s- sit at home and say what's going on, and this is not right, and this person is not a good, you know, governor, or senator, or whatever. Well, then, if if you have a better way of of doing things, then get out there and and get into it, right? And you know, nothing beats a failure but a try. Exactly. And that's how how my grandmother raised me. So it's always important, you know, and, and those politicians. Once again, it's about them listening to the younger generation, right? Because eventually, they're no longer going to be politicians, right? And those, right. those, that younger generation are going to be filling those shoes, and they have to be able to step into something that has been doing good work for for the people of this country. Mm-hmm. Very good. So as we wrap up here, I've got one for you. I've I've, I've started. It's kind of um, repeat and complete. Uh, when we think about everything that's going on and looking forward to it's about being hopeful. So if I say, I am hopeful that you completed, I'm hopeful that or I'm hopeful for? Um, I'm hopeful for a, a way for all of us to come together. And I'll, of course, always use a food analogy for us to come together at one table. I mean, food is, growing up, food was, always drilled into me from my grandmother that food is something that brings us all together. We all have to sit down and eat, no matter what we're eating and who's cooking it. We, and that that's a great place to start at the table, breaking bread, exchanging ideas, and also learning about each other. Like You, you never know how, how much you have in common with a person until you just really sit down and, and listen to their story and find out where they're from, how they grew up, what their family life was, what their childhood was about. So, you know, I'm hopeful that there is a way for us to, to really come together and exact some change, you know, and I'm hopeful that through through the protests that the eyes of America are are awakened with what is really going on as it relates to you know, to racism and, and, the, and the police brutality and the things that are happening in, in cities across the country. Um, and, you know, I'm just hopeful the, for the younger generation to to step up and do some things, but I'm also hopeful for the older generation to to sit sit down and listen and to help them as well. Each one, teach one. Yes, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, buddy. All right. All right.